10 Intriguing Facts About Melchizedek from the Bible Number 1. Only three books of the Bible mention Melchizedek. The books Melchizedek is mentioned in our Genesis, Psalms, and Hebrews. The Genesis account introduces Melchizedek near the beginning of Abraham's story. Melchizedek is introduced as a king during the time of Abraham. The Old Testament is silent about him until the Book of Psalms, which alludes to him when describing a royal priesthood. This is probably a good sign that the figure of Melchizedek had retained some religious significance to Abraham's descendants. Much later, in the Book of Hebrews, Melchizedek is shown as a case study for Jesus' priesthood. Number 2. The New Testament says more about Melchizedek than the Old Testament. Melchizedek is first mentioned in the Old Testament, and so you might expect the Old Testament to have more to say about him than the New Testament. But that's not how it shakes out, compared to the New Testament. The Old Testament doesn't say a whole lot about Melchizedek. His role in the Bible takes place in a span of just a few verses in Genesis, but the author of Hebrews unpacks his significance in great detail. Just to give some perspective, Melchizedek's name is mentioned ten times in the Bible. Once in Genesis 14, verse 8, once in Psalms 110, verse 4, and the rest are in Hebrews. Or to put it another way, the writers of Genesis and Psalms 110 give us four verses about Melchizedek. The author of Hebrews spends all of chapter 7 discussing his priesthood. Number 3. Melchizedek lived during Abraham's time. We first meet Melchizedek right after one of the less famous stories of Abraham in the Bible. After God called Abram from Yar of the Chaldeans, before his name was changed to Abraham, the patriarch finds himself in an interesting situation. His wealthy nephew Lot has been kidnapped. Kedolamer, the king who had been controlling the city-states of the region was off conquering the nearby world. While he's on vacation, five of the vassal kings back home rebel, including the king of Lot's town. As you can imagine, Kedolamer, we'll call him, Ched, isn't too thrilled to come back home and see that the mice have been at play. So Ched drives the five rebel kings into hiding, then takes the spoils from Lot's city. Unfortunately for Lot, his family and herds are part of Ched's spoils of war. So Ched makes Lot his prisoner and moves on. But Abram's not too happy about this. So he takes 318 highly trained warriors, beats Ched in battle, and takes Lot and the spoils back to Canaan with him. It's at this time that Melchizedek meets Abram and blesses him. Number 4. Melchizedek has no recorded family. The Jews were all about genealogies. Don't take my word for it. Read First Chronicles. Yet Melchizedek has none. There's no Melchizedek, son of so and so. No mention of a mother. No mention of a son. Not really anything. The author of Hebrews makes a pretty big deal out of this. He contrasts the lineage-based priesthood of Aaron with Melchizedek who has no recorded birth or death or anything, Hebrews 7 verses 3 and 8. This is where the discussion on Melchizedek gets really interesting and goes in many different directions. Was he just a righteous man? An apparition of Jesus before he was born in the flesh, called a theophany? An angel sent to govern the city of Salem? Of course, that's not really the author's point. The author of Hebrews is more interested in showing off Jesus' superior priesthood to the Hebrew Christian converts. Number 5. Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High. We get this from Genesis 14, verse 18. A priest is someone who performs religious rituals for divine beings on behalf of people. They also frequently offer sacrifices and do other things on behalf of humans. In a way, Priests are human go-betweens. They serve gods on behalf of humans, and humans on behalf of gods. This usually means priests are held to a different standard than other humans, so that they can be ritualistically pure enough to interface with divine beings. 
The books of Exodus and Leviticus give us a good look at some of the requirements God and Moses had for the Hebrew priests. We're not sure exactly what kind of rituals Melchizedek performed, but it's probably safe to assume that blessing people on behalf of God was one of them. Number 6. Melchizedek Blesses Abram Abram has just returned from defeating four kings in battle, and Melchizedek brings out bread and wine for the hero. Then Melchizedek blesses Abram. Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Genesis 14, verses 19 and 20. Melchizedek recognizes that Abram has aligned himself with the God above all other gods, and blesses both Abram and their mutual creator. Number 7. Melchizedek is the king of Salem. Salem was a city-state in the land of Canaan. Salem means full, complete, safe, whole, peaceful. The author of Hebrews calls attention to this when likening Melchizedek to Jesus. Melchizedek was the king of peace, which makes us think of another prince of peace we know Hebrews 7 verse 2. This is interesting for a few reasons. Remember the whole rebellion with King Ched that started this mess? Well, Ched had three loyal kings on his side, and five disloyal kings fighting against him. Each of these kings seems to have ruled some kind of city-state area, but guess which city never enters the fray, Salem. The city seems to live up to this safe and peaceful parts of its name, this is also interesting because the ancient town of Salem later becomes known as Jerusalem, which is where the temple of God that Solomon built would stand. You can see how the author of Hebrews would be especially keen on connecting Jesus to Melchizedek. Jesus is the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. And Jesus is the high priest of a new covenant, much like Melchizedek was a priest. Number 8. Melchizedek's name means King of Righteousness. The author of Hebrews brings this up in his argument for Christ's greatness. The name comes from two Hebrew words, Malak means king, ruler and Sadak, which means righteous, just, innocent. It's a pretty cool name. Number 9. The order of Melchizedek is royal and everlasting. Psalm 110 is a messianic prophecy that tells us two things God promised to do for Jesus. Make Jesus the king in Zion and make Jesus a priest. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4 And of course, the permanence of Melchizedek's priestly order is pretty important to the author of Hebrews since Jesus is the resurrected great high priest of the new covenant between God and man. Number 10. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham and Aaron. The author of Hebrews argues that when it comes to really outstanding human beings, Melchizedek trumps Abraham, so much so that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of all the spoils Abraham collected on his mission. And if Abraham looked up to Melchizedek, and Aaron looked up to Abraham, that puts the order of Melchizedek a deal higher up the totem pole than Aaron's priesthood. In conclusion, Melchizedek's story in the Bible leaves us with a tapestry of intrigue and spiritual significance. Through these ten intriguing facts, we have glimpsed into the enigmatic nature of this righteous king-priest. As we contemplate Melchizedek's role in Abraham's life and the typological connection to Jesus Christ, we are invited to explore the depths of divine revelation and the profound mysteries of God's plan. If you found these facts about Melchizedek fascinating, be sure to like and share this video with others who may be equally captivated by his story. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more enlightening content exploring the depths of biblical narratives and uncovering hidden gems of wisdom. Be sure to check out our other videos where we delve into the lives of extraordinary biblical figures, unveil the secrets of ancient texts, and provide thought-provoking insights into faith and spirituality. Thank you for watching, 
and may your journey through the pages of the Bible continue to inspire and deepen your understanding of God's unfathomable love and grace.